Okay, welcome back to part two with Bruce Cryer. We are talking about breath and thought and heart math. And we left off last time with uh, how breath and thought are not enough. And if you do not deal with the emotional body around what's actually happening, it's connected to the felt sense, then you can breathe all you want and it's not really going to fix anything. What's up, Bruce? How are you, man? Really good. Ready to rock for this, this part. All right, so let's talk a little bit about breath and thought, emotional regulation, and the emotional body and coherence and how that works then to mirror in the world around you. And then we'll talk about some applications for this. Sound good? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think the term you used, uh, emotional regulation, a lot of people are now calling it nervous system regulation, um, which to me is an important distinction because there's there are a lot of people using that phrase, nervous system regulation, vagal tone, vagal stimulation. And all of these are part of the autonomic nervous system and the reference to the fact that when your autonomic uh, nervous system is out of balance, the two branches are not working in a coordinated way. Chaotic rhythms result, but also depletion happens. The reason frustration or anger or feeling overwhelmed are so damn debilitating is there's no positive feedback coming back to you. You're spending all this energy and no positive outcome. If anything, is getting worse. So of course we'll be depleted. On the other hand, the act of feeling grateful, you feel good by feeling grateful. You're, you're, you're nur 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 nurturing yourself in the process of simply being grateful for things that may be going on in your life. So the idea of, of learning how to regulate emotions is really key. And I, I think another important distinction now is, we're, uh, in my opinion, this is not at all about repressing any emotions. It's learning how to regulate because in, in my experience, having gone through the loss of a number of family members, uh, the ending of my marriage at the time I had just finished going through cancer and staph infections and double hip replacement. I had a lot of emotions going on. I had to own them. I had to feel them. I couldn't write them off as like, I got to just be the, the, the strong male that's going to get through this no matter what, you know, I, I, that was not me. I could not handle it that way. I had to right. feel it and let myself understand it and, and then potentially have a whole new life, which is what happened. Fortunately that, it, it, but it took owning those emotions and not just right. not just shifting them too fast before having a chance to make sure I've really gotten to the, the core of it or, or to the depth of it. So that's an important part of this. So in emotional regulation is not just just switch out of that grief thought. No, just switch no. out of that negative feeling. Not at all. And I know you don't I know you fully agree with me. So that's that's kind of distinction number one. And I think, um, you know, to me, the fastest way uh, in it, in it, it's, just, it's this two-part thing. First is, is to just fully identify, fully feel what you're feeling. Allow yourself to feel. And part of the reason why in any kind of breath work, you need to slow down, slow down the mind enough, which is probably going a mile a minute with something that happened in the day, something you, you're facing when you get finished with this breath work. Your, your mind's often moving quickly. But just, so just slowing down the mind is not enough because usually what's fueling the rapid mind stuff is some unmanaged emotion. It's some lingering anxiety you've got about something that's longer term that needs addressing and you're not you're not addressing it. Or something that really hurts you and you haven't kind of gotten over the sting of that comment from some or the way they, you know, okay, I understand why you said that, but the way you said it, you know, you, did you have to do it that way? <laughs> you know, so whatever, whatever the particular um, version is. So I think what we've learned was that in order to sustain this coherent state and not just kind of force ourselves into it through right. breathing, which does feel good. Of course, it's right. not diminishing the, the sheer value of oh, just breathe. Just that is, is remarkable. The, the, the sigh of relief breath is you taught me that, you know, it, just that alone is, oh, is fantastically relieving, but the, the situation that caused me to need the sigh of relief may still be there in my system. I may not have resolved how I'm perceiving that, that person. I'm laughing because your sigh of relief was awful. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I didn't teach you that. You're stressed, Bruce Cryer. Let's do a sigh of relief. Mine was awful earlier today in the surgeon's office. Dude, my breath has sucked lately. There you go. I said that on YouTube. I mean, like, seriously, I'm like, dude, what am I even doing breathing right now? Kind of stuff. So anyway, back. Sigh of relief. Emotional regulation. Breath is connected in your experience, decades and decades, 
How? How has breath, how's a sigh of relief got anything to do with emotional regulation, let alone a five by five breath and RSA, rhythmic sinus, or sorry, respiratory sinus arrhythmia? How is there a connection? People watching are like, what are you talking about? Like, what's, yeah. what's that bridge right there, that mechanism before we talk about application of it? So let me clarify the RSA. And, and I think why that's been so essential to how why people love heart math and, and have, get addicted to it and want to use it the rest of their lives. The five seconds in, five seconds out, I think of it as, as training oneself into what the coherent state feels like, training yourself to be able to get into flow whenever you need it. When I when we were first developing this, I had a watch that would beep on the hour. This was like 92 or something. And every time the watch would go off, I would practice that breathing. So that it would become automatic and it would, it would feel completely normal to me. So before long, it became like, oh, this oh, five seconds in, five seconds out is fantastic. And it was preparing mm. my internal physiology to be able to then shift and hold a feeling of appreciation or hope or faith or, or whatever, or love, any of those things. So the combination of training your system, taking control of your system in a regulated five seconds in, five seconds out way, combined with activating a positive emotion, not just breathing five seconds in, five seconds out with, quote, no thought or any thoughts, but consciously, intentionally, a positive feeling that you're uh, pr projecting, that was super important and becomes kind of the training wheels <laughs> for yeah. learning how to get into the coherent state, sustain that coherent state. So when life is really fucked up, you're able to get in back into a coherent state that much quicker, feel what you're feeling that much easier. Why is the heart and breathing through the heart in your mind and your visualization important? Pick a level. I mean, if you're thinking energetically, the chakras, hearts from the center, three above, three below. There's a lot of systems that think of the heart as the distribution point energetically on, on that level. As, a, as an organ, the heart's absolutely a distribution point. The heart, the heart is also the do dominant electro and magnetic field of the body. It's also the prominent rhythmic generator of the body. It's, it's, it's the, the dynamo in the human system on all kinds of levels. So focusing on the heart is kind of awakening the heart. But there's another dimension to it too, which is we feel <laughs> elated feelings, exhilarated feelings, feelings of magnificence in the heart, but also the opposite. We often feel, oh, no. Yeah, that tightness in the chest. You ask people, where do you feel it? <clears throat> where do you feel that emotion? Oh, I feel it in my heart. I feel it in my chest. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. So the focus on the heart help in, in, in our view, and we we're able to validate this, validate this in some studies, the heart is connected to intuition as well. So the quieting of the body and focusing around the heart over time, it starts to feel like this is where I get more of my ideas, my creative ideas, my intuitive ideas. Some people say that's all happening in the gut. Wh wherever it's happening, I don't really care. Right. Well, I mean, here's the thing. They talk about the head, the heart, and the gut. Right. Exactly. Very few people are talking about the interstitium. The fascial layer is actually its own thing, and that's its fourth yeah. intelligence center. And then there's a fifth, the respiratory intelligence itself. And then you break it down to cellular intelligence. We have all of these intelligence centers. And as we know, the language of metaphor, that's what I teach in neuroacrobatics. I created a system that takes everything we're talking about puts appropriate language, metaphor, and cues, and takes a very simple breath, like your five by five, I call it. I do five by five in the gills all day long, start playing with it. And I took a breath and some images and played with it. And there's massive physiological effect because it trains in a substitution over time, a new baseline. Because all those respiratory and head, heart, gut, and all the intelligence centers, they all speak metaphor. They all speak poetry. Felt sense and subconscious are connected and they all speak the language of poetry. So if you have a really good metaphor, and I train people how to do that, how to spot your metaphor, how to spot what you're saying, you can hear it all the time. People are talking and they use metaphors that are colloquialisms, language that we all use, but in the description lies the affirmation. I tell people all the time, as I'm describing my P-A-I-N, my discomfort, my sensation I don't love, which you know is extreme throughout life, extended, and I deal with enormous pain, Yes. sensation. How do I do that? I don't go, I'm not in pain. 
I, I read today, uh, Jack Schwartz was doing very specific autogenics exercises, very cool, very tricky, very like cool pranayama kind of mating, amazing, like breath brain stuff. But he was just hardcore, not dealing with the emotions, just hardcore dealing with the physiology and the mind over matter, the yogi approach. It was different, but it was a yogi approach. So there's all these ways of muscling the nervous system into compliance, like a bending rebar. Or you could just chill out, figure out what metaphor the thing is using, the system's in already, swap it out for a better one with some music, and over time practice breathing an image in. And what happens is that image takes root and then has fundamental transformative power in the body, which then explodes into the world around you and patterns back as what you actually want. Mm. That's heart math. Breathing in through bits and pieces. Did you guys ever try breathing in and out of your elbow? <laughs> Where you're like, what about the taint? What about the knee? What about the toe? What about the ear? Like, how did you arrive on breathe through the heart? Because that's not a small thing. You could, because if you start breathing through the shoulders, you'll lose the coherence. I've done the monitoring. If you start to breathe anywhere else but in and out of the heart, you lose coherence. And if you start to think about anything other than love or happy thoughts, you lose coherence. How did you guys get to that? You just answered your own question. I mean, there was a strong intuitive sense, which is why heart math even was started in the first place, <laughs> that there was so much more to the heart than what Western medicine was believing in the, in the last 150 years. We set up a whole organization with a weird name to study it, saying there's stuff that Western science doesn't know, and they're screwing things up, and they're screwing up our perception of what the heart really is. They're trying to have us all believe the heart's just a pump. And don't bring it into business. Don't don't bring it into 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 in, uh, through the door when you arrive at work. Leave your your leave your heart at home. Right. You got a daughter with cr chronic Lyme disease. I'm I'm not going to give her any thought the entire day because I can somehow do that as a father. Really. Right. Or that that's a good idea as well. Really. That's so, healthy. Yeah. So we're screwing everybody out. So we 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 knew there were things that we could prove. We just didn't know exactly the, the mechanisms of how to prove it. We already knew from our own experience that by focusing on the heart, we were doing this before the research was kind of proving it out by radiating love like you would if you were a yogi thinking from, as the heart center, the, the middle chakra radiated from there, radiate love to all mankind, to all humanity, to all living things, whatever it may be. That was already a practice before we had any science to prove right. any of that RSA or heart rate variability or any of that stuff. So there was a strong intuitive sense this is this works and is important to humanity. Look at Buddhist meditation, loving kindness meditation. We weren't the first ones to come up with heart meditation. We we gave it science. Right. We gave it gave it a make sense so that so the mind could kind of shut off and say, okay, this wasn't random. They're not just about a bunch of hippies from California. <laughs> that are all about love. There, there is some science to this as well. So yeah, focus in and out through the heart. Hmm. Practical application of all of this. You went through some stuff. That's where we bonded. You nearly died a bunch. I nearly died a bunch. We've been through some things. I think the hardest thing for me to heal from is emotional pain and a broken heart. I only know poetically about a broken heart and we have referenced broken heart syndrome and what can you tell me about the emotions of heartbreak and how to actually heal a broken heart using your breath and the way you think about it in your experience. Do you have any experience with that? Or did you guys do any science on that? Hey buddy, if you've been through a shit breakup, Come here, we want to study you. Like, was that a thing or? Well, you know, I, I, I stepped away from the, the management leadership role of, of HeartMath a number of years ago, about 10 or 12 years ago. There may be some research around that kind of thing now, because for sure, especially in the last three or four years, the prevalence of, of appreciating how much we all have had trauma in our lives, which rises to the level of PTSD in many cases. It's mm. not just war veterans or people that saw the death of someone in their family or or child abuse. It, yes, those are extreme, but there's many other examples where it was just the relentlessness of the trauma, which yeah. has caused PTSD. So I think hard math has had an increasing sensitivity to the fact that, you know, as much as you may try to feel appreciation or gratitude in the middle of that, something could trigger 
old trauma. So I think it's it's a it's a big issue these days because it could have been having your heart broken in terms of love. You would love someone and suddenly they're gone or they don't want you anymore. Or it could have just been as a child feeling feeling unloved and the heartbreak of that, not not mm. even knowing it was heartbreak, but later in life realizing what my my tender little heart was always feeling belittled and unvalued and and my heart was breaking when it should have been growing and expanding. You wouldn't have thought that as a kid that it was broken heart. Right. But probably right. it was. So I think this is it's a big conversation. We could we could spend a couple of hours on broken heart, but to yeah, me, right. How do you fix it? I mean, what's in your practical experience? I have my own meditations and things that I do, and I'm working consistently with my heart. That's my that's my great battleground from now moving forward in life. My body and what I have going on in it is 100% reflective of what I have going on in my heart. And sometimes it takes a lot longer to clean up the train wreck than it did for the train to wreck. So you get to this... And then and go, okay, let's let's just pretend we can undo it. Undo the accordion, right? Pull it back out. Even if you could just do that, it takes longer to do. And so even though I'm thinking and breathing radically different than I've ever done, and I'm experiencing incredible benefit, two herniated discs, degenerative disc disease, failed surgery. I understand where the disc levels are and the Louise Hay emotional construct that says between this disc and this disc, there's this emotion stored and that emotion stored. And I have done that work and it's beneficial. So I'm not dissing it. Relax, hippies. For the rest of us, we know it's connected, Bruce. My body holds a record of everything throughout my life, but the heart in my experience, when it's damaged, the wheels are off. It's the connection to the spirit, that ineffable aspect, that breath. That's We didn't get around to that, but I think that's why the emotional body and the breath are connected is because it's connected to the spirit. Mm. And the spirit's bruised and tired. When I've lost my breath, when my heart is broken, it gets pinchy. And that's where darkness or evil or revenge or anger or resentment, French ressentir, to feel again, to bring that feeling back to cultivate it for a need, for power, for sympathy, for whatever it is. I bring it back. Well, guess what I also keep bringing back? As I'm refeeling it, my subconscious is pulling and more like that because that's just the physics of how the mental universe works. I spend a lot of time talking about the mental laws, the mental universe. We have laws of physics, laws of chemistry. Very few people talk about the laws of mental universe, the mentality that you create, what that does to your inner world, what that construct is and means where you end up living. We live in tight, broken-hearted, pinchy little boxes if we're not careful. And breath can only, <sighs> I started with the breath journey, open and expand and feel your heart. And guess what? When you get dropped at the deep end of the pool or the dark end of the alley, that goes away quick. It goes, whoo. So thinking and breathing with a broken heart has been dicey for me. And this is, I think, what people want to see. How do you apply a beautiful idea like coherence when the life you're leading that's really coherent still has some residue from the life you're not quite done with? And I don't mean past lives, relax, everybody. Fine, but... I mean, the life I led, like, 20s to 30s, 30s to 40s, and here I am. And <clears throat> about to have a birthday in a week or two. What is the value of coherence in your estimation with a broken heart? What a topic and what a question. Um, I think one of the first things is that the more we know how to get into a coherent state that equates to inner stability. It doesn't equate to everything is solved. It doesn't, it doesn't mean you have forgotten the pain, but you have a way of stabilizing it that you didn't always have, or you may have never had. And that is That's super key. important. That That's is super huge. Important. Yes. And as I said earlier, that does not mean you, you don't allow yourself to feel the grief or feel the heartbreak. Or, in fact, I feel that is absolutely essential. In my own journey, had I not done that, I know 
I know that the depths that I now can experience the positive in life are so much deeper and so much higher than what happened, what I could experience when I was struggling with understanding how to process negative emotions, going through three, two brothers, sorry, one brother, both parents uh, passing away from Alzheimer's, losing another brother to Lou Gehrig's disease, four neurological deaths close to me. Mm. Makes you think, why did I not remember that name? Why did I stumble over that? What mm. makes you think and makes you worry, right? And so to me with, with heartbreak, what's so challenging is that sometimes it's, it's hope that's been destroyed. There was a hope of the future. That's so huge. That, that being gone because they've died or yeah. because they've said, no, I can't do this after all, or worse, they're just gone. Like we, yeah. we live in a world of being ghosted and suddenly they just are gone and they, they still are reading your messages, but they're not responding to, to any of the messages. So in that world that we live in, it's like, ah, oh, I'm not even getting any closure. They're not even telling yeah. me why they're just, they just disappeared. And so all of that is, so the so coherence is a practice to help stabilize because there's no question that if we're, if our nervous system is shot, because all we're processing are the are one stressful feeling after another, our ability to anchor into anything beyond that is challenged. We're, we're, we're kind of lame. If, I mean, physiologically kind of lame. You following that? So, yeah. yeah so again, this, I think this uh, allowing the coherence, enabling a level of stabilization is essential. And I think, you know, in, in looking at my own uh, grief, because I've had any number of things, whether it's grief or things that just like, oh, oh, no, no, really? Oh, no. And and so I've allowed myself to feel the sadness. I've also looked at uh, over as I've matured. Um, what is the pattern here that that keeps playing out? Is it abandonment? Is it uh, is it rejection? What is it at the, the deeper that's getting continually re-triggered in different situations? Yep. And then then being able and this is where back to this a uh, uh, question you had a few minutes ago about where the sigh of relief to me is a, is a symbol is a metaphor for the letting go of all that. And so when I'm when I'm yes. down when I'm down in it, there's no resolving it. There's no perspective like well. It was a learning experience for, for you. Well, yeah, I will. I will yeah. probably get there. I, I I hope I do get there actually, but I'm definitely not there now. So meanwhile, I got this this yucky, awful feeling in my body, which is physiological, which is a biochemical. I got to let go of that shit because it's not doing me any good. And it's there's a tendency to hang on, right? Because yep. Number one, the shock. Number two, you, you can't quite believe this has happened, so you're wanting to not believe it's it's really true. So you you keep hanging on and keep hanging on. And I think there have been a number of times for me where being able to just let go and the sigh of relief was the was the key for me. At one time, as you know, it was when I had COVID, and and my body was just going crazy. And I finally realized I, I have resources in me. I've been practicing stuff yes. like this for thirty years, and I'm not accessing it. It's because I'm holding on. My body is my body is literally holding on, trying to figure out how to navigate through this. But I had to t take myself through more and more, best I could, the sigh of relief because I knew I needed to let go. And so I think that's that's part of where the idea of letting go emotionally never really appealed to me. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a cancer. I hold on. I attach. The good news is. Good luck getting rid of me, because I, I'm gonna I'm gonna want to stay on. On the other hand, the times I should have let go way earlier and didn't because I kind of kept holding on, kept hoping, right? So I understand uh, why letting go is so important and why it was so difficult for me for many years. That's because vital with pain. I want to just comment very briefly, and I think we should wrap this up. The single word that comes to mind when you talked about stability and building. That RSA, that sine wave, that beautiful coherent wave, that's balance. We could get into the work of Walter Russell. Robert Edward Grant is talking about it everywhere. It's remarkable. And there's a cosmology that explains it. If you don't like a spirituality and you, the cosmology we have doesn't explain what we're talking about here. Walter Russell invented a cosmology in the early 20s, sent it out to the world's top everything. Tesla sent him back a letter saying, please hide this book for a thousand years. They're not ready. And it explains all of this. Mm. So for 
curious people who want to dig through my YouTube conversations and find nuggets, there's a gold nugget. If you can understand words that are on the page, Walter Russell's your key. It explains balance. He says the universe in one word is balance. Balanced interchange. Or no. Balance. Balanced interchange. And if it was in three words, rhythmic balanced interchange. Mm. Universe in one word, two words, three words. Mm. So we're going to wrap this up. Emotional breath and thought as a single body that is balanced, where there is fidelity. True representation is what fidelity means. Between all parts, mm, yeah. we create coherence. That coherence inside us gives me a chance to work on my heart. As successive hurts have happened, yes, I'm still cleaning up train wrecks from the past, but I am creating zero new train wrecks. And so over time, what happens is things rapidly smooth out as coherence is prevalent. And what stands out is anything that's not coherent. So for a while, you're going to feel like I'm an idiot. I'm doing everything wrong. Nothing's working. And that is simply the notification that every place not in coherence is being pinged so that the universe can help you restore. Exactly. Beautifully said. Thanks, Bruce. Talk to you Thank again you. soon. Awesome. Appreciate you, brother. Love you, man. Love you, too.